Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art on Monday, March 4th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Miriam Deutsch, ATOA Programming Director. And tonight we have a terrific program to celebrate Women's History Month with Grace Rosselli's Pandora's Box Project, a panel discussion on the dubious constructs of age women art. Pandora's Box Project is a photographic portrait series documenting and celebrating the changing face and profound cultural influence of women artists and art practitioners, inclusive of trans, non-binary, genderqueer, and female individuals over the past decades. Tonight's artists, panelists, Grace Rosselli, uh, Nicole Awai, Cheryl Donegan, Carla Ganes, uh, Maria Elena Gonzalez, and Claudia Hart will address ageist and sexist constructs in the contemporary art world. Grace Rosselli is a Brooklyn-based multidisciplinary artist whose work visually explores women's narratives, outsider bodies, and the cultural constructs surrounding them. Rosselli has received numerous awards and grants throughout her career, including a 2023 New York State Council on the Arts Award and a New York Foundation for the Arts Fiscal Sponsorship for Pandora's Box Project. Rosselli's artwork has been included in a variety of publications and exhibited both nationally and internationally, including exhibitions with Anita Friedman Fine Arts Gallery in New York City, Mars Silver Design Lab in Westport, Connecticut, and with the Pentimenti Gallery in Philadelphia, as well as the Gementi Museum in the Netherlands. And her artwork and photographs are in private collections in the US and Europe. Rosselli received a BFA with honors from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1982. And she was awarded the Rhode Island School of Design scholarship to attend the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. In 1983, she participated in the Empire State Studio Residency Program in New York. And in 1984, she studied with Emilio Vendova at the Accademia del Bella Arte Venezia in Venice, Italy. So now I'm so pleased to turn the program over to Grace. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for the support and taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. I think time is like the most valuable commodity. And thank you ATOA for hosting this panel discussion. Thank you so much. Um, okay. And my panelists, thank you so much for doing this with me. All right, you, um, I'm gonna be putting a downloadable PDF with more information on this evening's uh, participants, their bios, website links, artwork, and a link to the Pandora site. I'll put that in the chat as soon as I finish talking. Okay, let me begin by introducing our panelists. Um, Nicole Away, her disciplinary oh, practice wow. includes a why. I'm so sorry, Nicole, and you just told me. Okay. okay. Uh, that's my fireball working. All right, Nicole Away, her discipline, her multidisciplinary practice includes painting, photography, installation and sculpture. She engages Caribbean and American narratives in a potent critique of cultural and identity politics. Her interventions in the U.S. monuments dispute with proposals for a new kind of monument underscore her commitment to reevaluating historical narratives and public memory. Cheryl Donegan transitioned from direct and irreverent takes on sex, gender, and art making in her video and performance art of the 1990s to her current takes on consumer culture and explorations of process through electronic media, where she's combining digital printing, hand dyeing, upcycling, installation, and painting. Carla Gannis is a transmedia artist and painter. She's known for her pioneering work fusing technology and traditional media. Throughout her career, she's worked with an array of mediums and tools, including drawing, painting, video, extended reality, and machine learning models to produce multi-layered narratives challenging aesthetic and societal norms with elements of power, sexuality, and storytelling. Maria Elena Gonzalez is a sculptor whose work combines a strong dedication to craft 
with a deeply conceptual framework resulting in complex installations and poetic arrangements that explore themes of identity, memory, dislocation, and the intricate relationship between nature and culture. Claudia Hart explores issues of identity and representation, integrating a feminist critique into the realm of digital technology and media. An early adopter of virtual imaging, she began using 3D animation to make media installations and projections in the late 90s. And as they were invented, other forms of VR, AR, as well as creating objects produced by computer, computer driven production machines. These are my very brief bios of incredibly accomplished artists that I'm proud to know. And when you can, please take a deeper dive into all of the information available online about these women. Okay, first of all, my use of the word women spelled with an X is inclusive of trans, non-binary, genderqueer, and female individuals. And as Miriam said earlier, Pandora's Box Project is a photographic portrait series documenting and celebrating the changing face and profound cultural influence of women artists and art practitioners over the past six decades. Art is a powerful tool for social and political change, influencing our deepest held beliefs and giving expression to what it means to be human. Since the feminist and civil rights revolutions of the 1960s, women have fundamentally reshaped how we experience art and culture, yet their historic and artistic achievements remain under-recognized, undervalued, and often near invisible within the contemporary art canon, the mainstream media, and more recent generations. The Pandora's Box photographs portray a powerful timeline from women artists and art practitioners working since the 60s through subsequent generations of visionaries with radically expanding notions of identity, methods of working, and platforms to communicate on. I mean, the internet came in in the middle of all this. Uh, together, these photographs form a collective portrait, an art historical archive that stands witness to a changing society because of the women visionaries who persevered year after year, making their art, raising their voices, and influencing untold others. The power of this project is its portraits and their accompanying stories. These are the unacknowledged histories behind our contemporary art world. And as we actively engage with art history, we're creating a new and living history. Uh, because I'm part of the community that I'm photographing, I empathize and identify with the women in it. This is key to how I photograph each individual, most of whom I'm meeting for the first time when I show up for a shoot. Uh, I'm not bringing professional photo lighting. Uh, there's no gear to set up. It's just me, my camera, and the person I'm photographing in a setting chosen by them. We share stories. I take pictures. And in this way, the resulting photographs are unique portraits, portrayals of each woman's particular individuality at a singular moment in time. It's, it's not the same lighting on everyone. It's like everyone is so, it's such a rainbow. It's such a privilege to be doing this project. Since September 2018, I have photographed over 280 multi-generational and diverse women for Pandora, contacted through an organic process of recommendations from other women and my own in-depth research. I've traveled around this country and abroad for pictures. I mean, you know, my transportation budget. During the 2020 lockdown, I photographed women online via Zoom and FaceTime. Upon completion, Pandora will include 360 portraits representing a full circle that is all of us now, honoring the voices of those who came before and leaving a legacy for future generations. Pandora's box needs to be fully realized now. It's, timely, it's timeliness is made more urgent by the loss of life that we witnessed during the pandemic and the aging of the older generation from the arts community. Two women photographed for Pandora, Helene Elon and Lynn Umlauf have died, and 
more women have been lost to dementia. These are incalculable losses to the broader arts community as women's cultural history already eroded by marginalization is now lost to time. You know, just in a plug, uh, Pan, you know, Pandora is largely self-funded and fiscally sponsored by the New York Foundation of the Arts. So if anyone feels free to move it, you know, to make a donation, it'll be tax free. The link will be in the chat and it's also on the project website. This pro project is a call to action. Um, we need to pound away at the ubiquitous banality and harm attached to the stickiness of patriarchal constructs. But it's also a victory, a celebration of progress. I'm gonna end with a quote from the writer, Rebecca Solnit. You row forward looking back and telling this history is part of helping people navigate toward the future. We need a litany, a rosary, a sutra, a mantra, a war chant for our victories. The past is set in daylight and it, come, it can become a torch we can carry into the night that is the future. So, Carla, take it away. Hey. Carla Dennis is our moderator for the evening and I'm so looking forward to this. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here tonight. And thank you to all of the panelists, to you, Grace, to ATOA um, for this opportunity. And I want to start, and then I'm gonna jump into questions, but I just wanna mention that the last panel I attended, it was organized and hosted by Grace Roselli, and it left a profound impact on me. I was particularly moved by a question from the audience about how the panelists wanted to be remembered. And the common thread in all of the responses was to be remembered for their contributions to society through their art, and embodying their spirit of activism and support for others. So this sentiment resonates deeply with the ethos of Grace's Pandora Box project, which challenges the entrenched patriarchal narratives of the solitary, often destructive artistic genius. And in this world rife with conflict and existentialist threats, the panelists' aspirations towards equity and compassion was incredibly inspiring to me. And I told Grace about it and I posted about it. So then Grace invited me to be here and to moderate this panel tonight. And it comes at a really pivotal time. And I think it was partly inspired by a comment from a successful male artist in his seventies about the recently deceased Martha Diamond. He remarked as an epitaph on Diamond's modest ego as if it justified the neglect of her work, even offering a hope that she'll enjoy her posthumous fame. This remark underscores a broader issue within the art world, the persistent undervaluation of women artists, especially as they age. And it is disheartening that art professionals and audiences relegate an artist coded as a female artist to the minor leagues when she displays humility or is actively committed to fostering community and social accountability. Okay, but I know you all are ready to get started and I can't wait for the panelists to begin talking. So we're gonna dive in. I have four main categories. Uh, I hope we'll be able to get to all of them. The intersection of ageism and sexism is number one. Number two, the difficulties in forming a holistic multi-generational sisterhood. Three, free the nipple, but let's also free the wrinkle. And four, solutions, constructive world rebuilding. So the first kind of category, the intersection of ageism and sexism presents this formidable challenge. We discussed it already in these intros for women artists as they're navigating the art world. And it's impacting not only the visibility and showcasing opportunities for their work, but also its critical reception and its valuation. So despite significant progress, this question still looms large. Why are women, and particularly women beyond this Goldilocks period, so between you know late 20s to early or mid 40s, why are they still marginalized? So panel, yes, you. Could any of you uh, share how you have encountered issues of ageism within the art world, especially in relation to the reception, interpretation, and valorization of your work?
Well, maybe I'll just start only because I did want to dig in a little bit deeper about um, the obituary of Martha Diamond, yeah. which you mentioned, which is something that um, I put up on my um, Instagram page, uh, Instagram being the kind of uh, uh, me uh, uh, highway of, of communication for the art world, it seems like now, um, because I knew it would get seen and hopefully commented upon, which is, you know, that I pulled a quote directly from the the um, obituary um, to because it just didn't settle with me that, first of all, the person who was asked to speak about Martha claimed to be an ally of hers, claimed mm -hmm. to admire her work, and was actually considered himself a supporter, who then chose to make a comment such as, because she was humble, uh, people use it as a justification for treating her work as minor, and that even though the neglect didn't make her happy, she persisted in spite of it. So even this model of the woman who persists um, uh, as applied to, you know, um, either in one hand valorizing, like she persisted even though she was ignored, but at the same time, there's a double coin side to that coin. She persisted um, in the sense of um, Elizabeth Warren in the well of the Senate who refused to stop speaking about a, uh, an issue, uh, she mm -hmm. persisted. So there's really no good way to own that verb uh, 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 in this case. So I was just incredibly surprised that this is what a supporter chose to say, who, I'm also surprised that this is what an editor chose to select as a quote. Imagine that from a supporter that forevermore, when people choose to look up in the New York Times, Martha Diamond's obituary, this is what they will read. This assessment of her as somehow not playing the game correctly. Um, that an editor at the New York Times, paper that runs a feature called Overlooked No More, which rewrites obituaries for historically yeah. famous women who did not get obituaries in the New York Times despite having merited or earned them by their accomplishments. Getting a New York Times obituary is no small thing. And Martha Diamond certainly earned one. But what a, um, what a, a bitter dinner <laughs> she <laughs> was served in the end. What a bitter plate. Um, that, uh, and then I hope she likes it. Now that she's lost all control over her reputation, I hope she enjoys that this is what's be, what what is the discourse around her. Um, it it just spoke to so much loss of agency by an artist who, at the same time, people seem to agree merited agency. And I found this whole affair so utterly utterly disturbing that I felt that I had to step out on my own page and say, hey. Is, Let's talk about me? it. Could this be me? Will this be me? Is this any of us? And why was it Martha? So those are my questions. Yeah, I'm really glad you gave more context well, to well, really... what I would what I would add to yeah. that, um, Carla, is why was he even why did I even ask him to write to comment in, in the obituary? Why was him? Pit. Well, he went. That's 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 what I feel. Like, so, you know, so why not you know, someone else? You know, a was, woman who is a friend of hers, etc. It's sort of like again, you're gonna need a white guy validating women. But the mm. the point I'm trying to make is that he was a supporter. He claimed to support her. He had curated her into a recent exhibition, and this is what I'm saying. This is what passes for support, even when you get that. No, this is what you get. It has something to do. I know why he was chosen. It has to do with market value. And this also goes to the heart of the issue. In other words, this is a blue chip artist um, with very high market value. And so part of the weirdness of this whole story or all of these stories, um, of, of which I'm sure mine is probably strangely inverted because I'm coming into the larger art world, re uh, igniting my painting background because mm -hmm. I wanted to escape into the painting world, which is so much better. Hold on to mm -hmm. your seats than mine. 
But aside from that, what was interesting about the comment was this is a blue chip artist. So they were valorizing her mm -hmm. from the point of view of a very expensive artist. So the question is, could you find a very expensive woman artist of their age? Because, no, you cannot, right? And, and, and that is our, also what's fascinating. There is now a market. I mean, as I've returned to painting and I've had tremendous luck there and I asked myself, why? And I, I found that actually because of the big success of rediscovered 90-year-old women painters right before they die, um, there is a market for 70-year-olds, which I happen to be one year off, but close. And so although the women 70-year-olds are very cheap Huge. compared to the 70-year-old guys, mm -hmm. um, but have speculative possibilities due to the uh, uh, you know, the success of 90 year old recently deceased um, be, and also because of bodies of work. So I think in the case of what you're describing, there was an attempt to valorize her by mm -hmm. saying, look, this blue chip artist thinks she was good and she could have been blue chip, but she was too humble or whatever, shy. Right, not playing the game. Or whatever. But that maybe she wasn't because her options were less. And, and when a woman does that, they're actually further marginalized. They talk too much or they're too uh, obnoxious, right? So there's less options. So mm -hmm. it's this feedback loop mm -hmm. of an in inequity that is too late to fix. It's better for maybe younger women and the higher priced women. I, I recently went to that show at what was it called? It's called the Far Shoe. What, what is it called? The Far Shoe Collection, Grace. The what? Oh, that Far exhibition shoe. Make, making her mark. Far yes. Gar. Oh, Shagar. Yeah. Yeah. Shagar. Yeah. 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 It was a wonderful show. And I, you know, very rarely get to see so much because I'm in a digital space. And so it was all handcrafted work. And I was looking at the prices and Grace, we talked about it when you came to my home and you were telling me that the older women, the prices of their work, people my age, um, compared to the younger women in that show, you were telling me the price differences. So Cheryl, it's all about money. Oh, I agree. Capitalism plays an enormous role in many of these problems uh, without a doubt i mean it's it's i mean besides the setup that you've presented you know i mean it's it's a it's you know it's painful that um you know uh uh that um he, he bringing her into that group couldn't have been done while you know she was alive i mean because now it's just a feast of you know necrophilia where you know <laughs> the table has been set by the dead woman and let the feasting begin. Um, and celebrate. It, 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 it's, it's, it's ghoulish. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, 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 ha, it, it is a kind of, you know, capitalistic, uh, I mean, it's one of the, you know, kind of excesses of uh, uh, capitalism to, uh, that never seems to uh, uh, stop uh, feeding off bodies. I'm going to interject here to to kind of uh, go on to our next topic, which has already emerged in this conversation, where we're talking about um, younger female artists, female identified artists, and those who are more mature, and these difficulties in forming holistic and multi generational sisterhoods. And one thing I want to share is just a personal anecdote first, and then dig into this with all of you. Um, I was overlooked several years ago for this group exhibition, and it was focused on artists creating selfies. And at the time, I was actively working on a selfie project. But the selected artists were all um, female and non-binary artists, but between the ages in their 20s or 30s. And I was 45 at the time. So there was a panel discussion held and a question arose in the audience about this, you know, the, the age selection. 
And then um, one of the curators inquired if I felt excluded. Well, I did feel sidelined, but then I was afraid to voice those opinions publicly, thinking I would be perceived as complaining. So, you know, again, like this idea, I was trying to be humble or that I wasn't being supportive of emerging artists. So digging into this, have you felt wary or self-conscious at some point in your career about speaking up about exhibitions not being inclusive, particularly of women over 40, for example? And, you know, maybe talking to um, about generational divides and, um, you know, instances where there might be mentorship going from one direction to the other. But let's kind of unpack this a little bit more about, you know, generational divides that that might, you know, um, obstruct, you know, more kind of support holistically. You know, it's 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 funny, but um, in this moment, after you know what we just discussed, I'm thinking that, you know, this is, it's really maybe, as much as it is maybe sexism, even ageism, it's about the industry always wanting new discoveries, mm -hmm. and I find myself in a moment where um, I am being valued for my opinion more than my artwork, um. And, you know, that even all the, you know, the folks who have been supportive, but, you know, you know, art writers, curators, you know, they're, they're in this perpetual loop that they have to be, you know, running down the new discovery, the new thing, you know, the next new thing. Um, and we're, you know, being put in the position sometimes to, to validate the new thing for them, you know, um, that's and that's that's I think that's also something now being of a certain age um, as a woman artist that the you know the value yeah the value sometimes of my opinion is more wanted than my artwork. Fascinating, yeah. And sometimes for younger artists, the value of being something you know, new, instead of focusing on their art, it's more about kind of um, what they represent. And that's also unfair. Who would else, who else would like to speak to this though? I mean, it's, you know, we're almost reiterating something that I think everybody on this panel and on this Zoom knows. We've seen it when the market was focused on students, MFA, like nobody mm -hmm. wanted to exhibit or sell anyone that was not just out of school or about to get out of school. And then, you know, it goes and it shit is like, okay, we got tired of that. What's going to be the next thing that's going to sell? And then you have, you know, 104 year old ladies being sold. New discovery. <laughs> Boom. So, and finally, Carmen Herrera gets a retrospective at the Guggenheim at the tender age of 104. So, you know, it's like this pendulum that is dictated by the market. And, and it's sort of like, it's nothing new. And it's it, that's, that's what makes this whole industry move around because it is an industry um, mm -hmm. and we're part of it in major or minor or somewhere in between or sometimes more present or less present. But we're, it's a it's an ebb and flow kind of a thing. I don't I don't know if there's like a, an answer to a solution because it's not a problem. It's a mechanism. No, a it's mechanism a problem. Is not a problem. It's hmm. a problematic mech. It's a problematic. It's mechanism. a problem mechanism. Problematic mechanism. Right, right, right. It's, 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 it's a mechanism. It's, it's a system. Wait, how many? Yes, okay. but it's also how many of us speak out when we feel like we've been let. I know my default. Always, <laughs> always, always. I'm a pain in the ass to a lot of people because they don't include women. They don't include Latinas. They don't include X, X, Y, and Z. And I'm a pain in the ass to a lot of people. So you do have to speak up. That's it. Yeah, I'll shut up. I'll and shut up it's now. More, <laughs> and it's, it's more and it's in numbers. I mean, it's also, I think um, today, actually, I didn't read his whole post. Walter Robinson, he was saying something about, you know, Cindy Sherman's show that she has up now with the with the faces that are, I mean, it's fabulous, like aging faces, but all kind of distorted, you mm -hmm. know, and Clarity Haynes paintings mm -hmm. of crowning babies. You know, and he was talking about the grotesque and like the grotesque in war movies. And then you moved on to those. 
you know, and, <laughs> and in this Women's History Month, you know, this Women's History Month, um, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about recently, I mean, how how our bodies are canonized into media. I mean, it's like all those war movies are fabulous. We want to see them. It's art. They're great. Those shoot 'em ups, you know, the getting into all the details of the, the bloody gore and like pulp fiction and stuff. But how many movies are just as exciting about a crowning baby, you know, or a woman's wrinkle, or it's it's the language, it's the way we view this. It's like there's got to be more women like Kamal Shah and and what is her name, Valeria Napoleone, you know, collecting just women, more women in numbers, you know, and and being a, and speaking out about ageism like really saying i was left out of this because of my age i mean how many of us do really do that instead of someone saying no you're just a lousy artist <laughs> well maria it seems you do and and i'm yeah. happy to hear that um claudia do you want to weigh in here about speaking up to these things or speaking about them let me unmute me all um, right it's very much more extreme in the digital world because it's invested in newness. So, you know, it's called new media. Mm. And so um, I think you could bring it also back to the 90s when you're talking about the emergence of the speculative uh, art market related to Wall Street blowing up, like stocks weren't even speculative at that time. And it was the same time as the boom, the first boom in the internet boom. And um, so at that point, newness was tied to Google, right? Artists were doing internet work and Google Googleification had to do with a giant corporation selling new products and Apple and iPhones and new gadgets, and it's called innovation culture. So mm -hmm. my area is more radical than um, the, let's say with painters where you're allowed, one of the assets is you're supposed to be wise or um, poetic or deal with history, right? You emerge from a history, of, uh, which is art. And we emerge from an ahistorical idea of new iPhone, new product, which speeds up to a crazy consumerism. So as a result of this, now I'm going to go fast because it's very abstract. I mm -hmm. felt that not I'm lucky that I haven't been erased. You know, I'm like, feel like I'm one of the oldest non-dead people in the <laughs> digital art space who, because it extends to men as well who is active and has lots of opportunities. Um, so because of that, I started, and yes, Nicole, I was, I'm was i always being asked because I was also a professor and I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for many, many years and just invited back to do more of it. Um, so um, where I'm asked to help um, bring in the next new thing, the next new mm -hmm. thing, the next new iPhone, the next new whatever. And I and in the space of digital, what that means is every new product line that emerges because it's invested in new Google iPhone, right? The iPhone 14, forget about the seven. You're some kind of loser if you have a six um, phone, right? Mm -hmm. um, that people were being erased at such a rapid rate because every one moment has to say it's new. And it's very ahistorical. And it's so I just realized that my peers were being erased. Like people who built art movements were being written out. Mm -hmm. So I decided to put them back in again. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I didn't, Grace, decide to complain about it because I knew if I said, you guys do this, mm -hmm. um, that they would ignore it. Um, so lead by example. So I decided I was just going to gather together the people who were currently, many of whom were my friends or my husband or men, you know, um, people, uh, the generation before the NFT ones, the most commercial and the most new, new, new. Mm -hmm. And I gathered together offhand 31 people and I wanted to frame it um, to make an exhibition about it. 
And I've been working on that and writing about it um, and have actually a lot of interest. These are people between born between 1945 and 1960 who have literally been erased out of the history. Mm -hmm. They're not part of anything. And um, I was told by a curator who I really admire, you'll never get any institution to do that show. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's true or not, but um, I mean, I have alternative, you know, an art center. I don't know if that counts as an institution. Mm -hmm. But um, it does. It does, okay, good. Mm -hmm. But um, so this, you know, w the space I'm in is a more radicalized version of what you all experience. Well, that brings up a good point. Yeah, and Nicole, I think you're about to answer that because what I really appreciate about this panel is you all come from different positionalities within your practice. So you probably have inhabited different art worlds, so to speak. So Nicole, what were you going to say? No, no, I it's it's no. I'm, I think it's interesting, um, but Claudia, you know, with Claudia's talking about in terms of sort of the digital world and art, but also seeing it, seeing it sort of being in like the hyper compressed form of like the same issue in a way, right? Um, and it's, and, and you know, and it's true, um, I, I agree. I mean, complaining, I, I don't know if complaining about it would have ever helped anyhow. <laughs> it's not going to help. Um, you know, so it's constantly trying to reposition yourself. Um, you know, at the same time, though, uh, I think it also ties into this um, um, erasure of history that is going on now. Um with with you know i don't know if it's a result of the digital age era or if this was always the way it is you know and i think it goes into another question we had you know it's like you know you have to kill kill the previous generation off but there's i have the oedipus question yeah yeah exactly yeah. there really seems to be this amnesia or wanting to erase history mm -hmm. while you know you see people reprocessing exactly what was done in the 90s, et cetera. Um, and you and, see that in the painting world and sculpture world. Oh, I, too. I you know, yeah. I see, you know, and and not wanting to see themselves as the continuum of that and connected to that, but wanting to pretend that they have originated things that they obviously have, you know, seen online or seen elsewhere and, and not wanting to give any of that credit. Um, I, I think it's the nature of uh, you know what um what the digital digital space has you know the way they've been educated or the way um you know and it's not and I and I don't want to throw everybody in that bin but I I feel as if you know this idea around something being made over time developed learned you know um you know enduring with rigor you know, it's 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 a hard battle for them, you know, anybody who's interested now because everything now is supposed to be instantaneous and yeah, you know yeah. they reinvented the wheel. Yeah. So I don't I know, mean, it's hard and in ways maybe it's even harder to be them now. I don't know. Yeah. And Cheryl. Well, well one thing, you know, I would comment on it is, you know, I mean, I, I that you know this this mandate for everything to be new and and to co constantly be like chasing the next horizon of, of newness is is a real edict you know uh, again of, of the type of capitalism that we've developed which you know as as much as we we pursue it in both our practice and our fantasy lives um it's actually um it, it literally antithetical with life i mean in the sense of life can't always be new um and 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 live it in in the sense that yes every day is new but then there's also as as um uh nicole was mentioning the idea that uh as an artist adopting uh, uh an idea that you're pursuing that you might not you know know the how of it know the why of it that i'm doing something how shall i do it why am i doing it and and how that changes i mean that's something that is so durational over long, long stretches of time that can't really 
it moves at, at such a pace that it can hardly be be conceptualized as new all the time. Um, so it's really like a kind of a losing game um, because at, at the same time, there's a, a, a demand in terms of, um, you know, concepts about branding, you know, and that we're all supposed to be ourselves brands. I mean, one thing that the market, you know, one can learn about living in in in, a, in this kind of culture is that um, one thing uh, 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 brands don't like is 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 newness. It, 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 changing a brand can be the kiss of death, and you know, an artist changing their work, you sullied the brand. Um, mm -hmm. So these kind of things are are really at odds with each other, um, and 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 the kind of conflict that they create. I can see the 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 deep turmoil that it poses in people because how am I to be constantly new and yet never change to protect my brand? Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are like mm -hmm. the, the riddles of the Sphinx. Um, and so it, it again, I just think that you know it comes down to this kind of you know the rapacious uh, and, uh, and and careless. Uh, uh, adoption of, of of models of capitalism down into the most intimate uh, corners of our lives. Um, even the idea of generation is 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 so. Um, um, I mean, biblical. You know, generations that could can be conceptualized as twenty five years. Now they're more like a you know twenty five months. You know, before like a new generation is supposed to crop. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim Berners-Lee talked about internet years and how the internet year has shortened, you know, and, and so the, same, the rapacious, right. But at the, at the same time, the internet is, is the home of everything. You can mm -hmm. find the most obscure things forever preserved on the internet, if you're willing to look, if you're willing to get out of the, 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 the commercialized channels of uh, uh, the TikToks and the Instagrams. If, if, and you'd be surprised how many people don't who don't venture on their own to, to discover a little known artist and go looking, you know, uh, uh, he or she lives, they live on the internet, um, but maybe not always in the spaces that you think the major hub space. The mainstream co spaces. Co controlled by corporations. I mean, the old internet is still there if we choose to look for it. Yeah. I just, regarding time, I am going to skip over one question, which was free the nipple, if we have time later, but also free the wrinkle where we were talking about social media and beauty standards and and quite a few of these issues that Cheryl you were just raising and I feel like you've already kind of you know um, spoken a little bit to uh, that issue of branded identity and how that impacts our careers. So I want to get to solutions and Claudia Nicole you all have already begun to talk about this in terms of being proactive and it's not about complaining but it's actually like through your actions, you can affect change. And so, you know, based on our conversation, we generally agree there are still curators, galleries, collectors, and other artists who remain oblivious to ageist and sexist practices. Um, I put together some prompts. I am not treating you all like chat GPT, but just, you know, to get the ball rolling. Um, and, you know, one kind of prompt or question are what are ways to encourage others outside of a community of female artists over 50 to support and participate in more intergenerational dialogue and inclusive curation? And if you have examples, you know, that where you have been proactive in organizing something like this or just some ideas you want to spitball on. Grace, are you? Yeah, yeah Grace, jump in. Yeah, no, well, first of all, with Pandora's box, um, I made the an effort to make it very multi-generational. I wanted all those earlier generations, mostly because I want I wanted to meet people. I wanted to see what was going on. Um, I spoke recently during a studio visit with a woman about my age and she had curated a show when she was younger that had to do with invisibility. I forget what the, what the exact topic was. It was at the new museum, but I was like, mm -hmm. did you include any older women? She's like, no, she's like, I didn't even think of it. You know? So that I think is part of the problem too. I think younger women, because they, it, it's like, people having babies until maybe you have a baby you don't really you could empathize you could you know but you don't really know what it is to have your body radically change in that incredible pain you know um you know and of course the lovely baby that comes out but I mean the um 
you know, the, the younger women, I don't think, how did, how do you get it through a younger woman's head or a younger person's head? We're all in this together. It is one flat line, you know? Sometimes, I mean, because I see this with teaching and uh, Claudia, you might want to speak to this because I know, you know, from your years of, of teaching at the university level too, or anyone else who wants to chime in, but, but also there's this misperception that, oh, well, she is this age, so she's established. She doesn't want to be in this little show or she doesn't want to be part of this because, you know, these are all emerging artists. And so they have this misconsumption that we're established, whether, you know, it's within, you know, our identity as professors or as artists. And it's like, hey, wait, no, no, I'm still applying for things. I still want to be, you know, included or I want to participate in these things. And so I think it's about communication. I think that that is really crucial. Yeah. Well, you, have to, you have to be proactive as well. It's not just about yeah. communication. Uh -huh. you, to, you actually have to instill certain things. I was I was a professor also, mm -hmm. and I had to definitely change the curriculum and demand as a chair of the Department of Sculpture from my professors to include in their syllabi and in their classes women artists of all ages. And, you know, and then we can also boycott. I mean, I have boycotted exhibitions because they only included men. And mm -hmm. I was very vocal about that. And it's like, no, you know what? You shouldn't even mention the curator or the show because they're not worth mentioning because they're exclusive. And so there are things that you can actually do. And I just want to do a shout out here because we've been talking about generational and mm -hmm. a former professor of mine Dr. Cassandra Langer is on Zoom and a former student of mine, Becca, is also online here. And Hello, Cassandra and Becca. Thank you. For I have here. been supported by my professor and I have supported my former student. And so in that proactive way, there's an arc that's alive and where you can make Beautiful. change. But it's Beautiful. like blah, 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 blah is one thing. Actually boycotting, actually removing x y and z and including things and demanding things from the people that you, that work for you in the university is how you create change mm -hmm. you know uh, i think you uh, know i just wanted to say you know um Maria Elena, it's, it's it's so true i think maybe we don't even realize that we have always done this because we didn't have a choice you know mm -hmm. um you know, we had to learn how to circumvent all of this and go ahead. And as you were saying, you know, I've been teaching for years and, um, you know, being in the position of, you know, often being, you know, the, the, the faculty who is always showing them new artists, new work, you know, um, and, and talking about, you know, a, a spectrum of, of artists um, and, uh, you know, diversity, as opposed to, you know, other colleagues who, who have just their, you know, bag of tricks that they keep pulling out, you know, I think we, we, we do this and we've been doing it. And so therefore we don't even acknowledge that we have been actually operating in this way this whole time, you know? Um, so that's why it's interesting because that's when I'm like, how do I answer Carla's question here? And I'm just realizing, well, no, actually, this is what we've been doing. Um, so what are the results of that to this point? So it's just been this intuitive approach and, you know, not something that's even conscious. It's it's just a mechanism to build community and to, you know, propagate your careers and those of others. I, I wanna, Claudia, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always want to look at things in a systemic way. Mm -hmm. And I think, Several of you, both Cheryl and Nicole, everybody talked about um, one thing. I think, Nicole, you mentioned something about MFAs. So MFAification on the one hand, um, marketing and branding, uh, Cheryl, um, categories. So the brand, you see this through academization, this idea of the institutionalization, the departmentalization of categories, and the categories are your brand. And so actually, when you look at art, 
art is a big flow over time. And if you want to use a trendy um, um, institutional world, you could say intersectional, like mm -hmm. art is intersectional, meaning it deals with certain human issues, problems that humans worry about and suffer about and uh, uh, celebrate um, over time. And it's translated and retranslated through power systems, who's being left out, what are the tools you use, all these things. And curating tends to focus on these uh, institutional categories. Um, yet <laughs> meaningful things could happen if it was intersectional, like what's the human issue? And you can find that everybody in all the different categories are addressing those things. And so it has to do with institutionalization and MFAification and market all intersecting beginning in the 90s. Hold on, I have, I have to say this before, before we go on. You know, I don't know if that is necessarily what I'm seeing is the case when coming to us, because that's, we've always been intersectional, you know, we've always had to do that. Um, we've been doing that. That's the way I have operated in those universities and academia, you know, exactly what you were saying, you know, it's not these categories, everything has been interconnected. And, and that is the way that I talk about art, think about art, show, you know, art to them in these spaces. So actually, I think we've our presence in these spaces have challenged and transformed those institutions to a great degree. I don't know if we we get any credit for that. I you know um what is the you know maybe we haven't examined the effect of that now. Um, maybe that's and that's a question moving forward. That now that we're seeing it, I'm thinking about it and wondering you know what would be the results of that. And Cheryl, you, I think you were going to. Yeah, Cheryl was close. Oh, oh, I, I just, um, and I've been recently, it's funny, the, you know, the idea of category comes up because I've been really thinking, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, just the importance of trying to, it's not that you can never exist outside any of these structures. It's very, very difficult to just invent something completely new that's independent and uh, absolutely un, unencumbered by any of, of these structures. That's it, 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 it would be very difficult, almost impossible to do that. But say, say the way, and I think it, this is why I admire, say, drag culture so much or ballroom culture in terms of looking at the way uh, people would go about subverting a culture that is excluding them by addressing its categories, by literally addressing the idea of category and turning it on its head as something mm -hmm. that anyone can participate in because a category uh, almost by, by, by uh, pantomiming its, its, its definitions um, in order to both kind of celebrate and mock them at the same time and kind of defy them by asserting oneself in that category. But more importantly, like just dissecting category and even asking the question, can someone walk in more than one category? I, I, I personally think it's essential to be able to walk in more than one category. For sure. And that gets back to intersectionality, you know, and the idea that um, there's kind of all of these different intersections in identity and how we can find compassion for one another and empathize with one another instead of maybe more competitive patriarchal models of, you know, it has to be brute force. And, and again, I'm oversimplifying, but just, you know, kind of comparing and contrasting. Um, approaches. And, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask each of you, we've talked kind of, we've talked specifically about academia and the roles that you have played and how you've affected change there or the resistances that you have also faced within those contexts or silos, etc. Because that's another thing, you know, we find in academia, the siloed um, kind of educational system. But outside of that, you know, I've mentioned before, you each have very diverse practices and, you know, these illustrious careers. Are there spaces that you can speak to that 
are different from, I mean, can you compare and contrast, for example, um, areas where you've, you've lived or uh, residencies that you've visited in certain places where you found that there were different kind of paradigms and constructs and you were like, wow, why can't this, you know, kind of effuse everywhere? Uh, I don't know. Does that kind of make sense as a question? And do you have any examples? This is my idea of, of, you know, world building and, and thinking about like positive, you know, kind of or aspirational examples here. The thing with the residencies is that they are a system in and of themselves and they mm -hmm. themselves have to be worked on. Because, for example, the American Academy in Rome, Anna Mendieta was there, I forget mm -hmm. what year, but it took 28 years for another Latina, myself, to be a Rome Prize winner. Wow. So it's a system, and I have to to give credit to a, a a major patron or matron of the arts, Agnes Gunn, who has been helping to change the way that the American Academy chooses the participants and bringing in a jury that's diversified. That woman has done so much across the board in not just one institution, but many, and in society with social justice that it takes a lot of money and yeah. focused actions to change the system. So again, these residencies, they have to be revamped. They have to be reinvigorated. They have to be diversified in mm -hmm. order for them to reflect our society as it is. Yes. Would anyone so, else? I haven't yeah. been to one that is, you know, top, you know, has, has, and it's like, how do they do it so it could be done, you know, other than Skohegan? We're doing mm -hmm. pretty well there. Claudia or Nicole, Cheryl, Grace, anyone else want to speak to that? Do you have any examples that come to mind? I gave up. I'm sorry to say, folks. But I don't think you can change. I think uh, um, institutions, I really don't. For me, after teaching for all these years, I think it's a one person at a time thing. I mean, from teaching, I learned that I can help somebody and I can connect to some people. And, you know, that actually spreads. Like I don't have grandiose plans actually. So even when I wanted to bring this group of people who were left out, it's, well, let me just give these people a show, not change the system because I don't think I can. And my network, part of the reason why I'm not a race is over the years, because I'm an early adopter in an area that became widely adopted, my one people at a time, my former students who grow up and people I've mentored over years, such as you, Carla, and here I am on this yeah. panel. I think right? I, I agree with that a lot too. I think it's like one person. I mean, yeah. I've, I've never taught and I haven't have really had the chance to do residencies. I don't want to leave my dog. I've had kids, <laughs> you know, so going forward, I want to do residencies. So anyone having residencies out there? Anyway, um, but doing Pandora's box, you know, again, it, it, it does seem to be that kind of one person at a time, you know, educating. But it's like you never know who that one person is. Agnes Gund is one person, yeah. you know. So you don't know who the one person to the one person to the one person you know, it's like you just got to keep hammering away, you know, all those little drops make a big something. But oh. but one thing that Maria Elena mentioned was Agnes Gunn is one person with a lot of resources. <laughs> so like one of my other prompts was about could there be state or national changes to art policy in terms of representation and support for female identified artists with decades long careers? Like, is there somebody with a lot of money and a lot of power is there one person, we already have one example, but where we could actually talk about legislation, we could think of this outside of, and I, I agree with you, Grace and Claudia, that the one person at a time model can be 
very um, uh, enlightening and important to us, you know, because, uh, you know, making those kind of connections and this reciprocal kind of relationship of support, that, that, that's, that's so important. But, but again, the idea of systemic change, is there or do any of you have ideas about those kind of possibilities where it would be more kind of um, a more galvanization of a larger group people and an intergenerational or multi-generational group of people who want to support, um, you know, even legislative change. If you have the opportunity to be on a board of an mm -hmm. institution or an organization or start an organization that you can bring in people to address specifically legislation, then get on those boards and make a difference. That's a great, be, be, great that, yeah. be that one person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that needs to be somewhere because our voice needs to be heard. Be that person. I mean, that's just like the 1960s where artists started to write art criticism. And it was really about taking on more agency in terms of these currents in art and artists being able to articulate what they were doing and control those narratives a little bit more. And so what if more artists were on boards, for example? Yeah. Any other thoughts? That's also about grassroots politics, right? Boards is this lower level. Mm -hmm. it's, not mm -hmm. the, it's not the top of the system. That's really a good idea, Maria in it, that it's the grassroots that you can enter at this kind of more microcosmic level rather mm -hmm. than top down, but bottom up. Yeah, I mean, uh, for what it's worth, I mean, you know, I had the opportunity to address uh, some uh, graduate students from my alma mater, which is Hunter College. And, you know, one thing I found really difficult was to try to translate, you know, my experience of, you know, while I came to New York in, you know, the 80s and I did this and I did that into advice for what they should do, considering right. the terrain had changed so utterly. But one thing I kind of thought was, um, I kind of offered up maybe a little bit of honesty was like, let's, you know, in a graduating class, not everyone's going to be a working, practicing artist in five, 10, 15 years. It's just, that's not the reality of the way it shakes out. However, um, there's for uh, to consider for other people, for, for anyone, the idea of, of, of still, you know, uh, not, participating by, by you know, opening a space or like creating a, a studio building where artists could work, you know, this idea, you know, con, con, concurrent with this idea of like, there's vast wealth in this country, you know, there's like vast generational wealth that's being transferred mm -hmm. every, every year. So if, if you're the, you know, everyone, you know, puts down the trust fund kid, you know, but why doesn't that kid buy a building and turn it into artist studios? That would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and instead of uh, denigrating those with uh, money and privilege, exactly. how could we, yeah, actually. How could, instead of shaming people, because, you know, I mean, I'm sitting in, you know, to pay for the education. Some of these people have money and their parents have money or their grandparents had money. They were financed. And instead of shaming those people who say, turn it into a, a not-for-profit turn it into, you know, uh, a place where artists can come and work or some kind of space like that, that uh, plows that money back into the arts community. Because personally, I think we're in a very dark moment legislatively, uh, people. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I see this is true. I don't, I, yeah. don't see that <laughs> I don't see that really getting top priority. That was but a I, kind of Pollyanna question. I, I, I don't know it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I, now this was not one of the prepared topics or questions, but I went to the Judy Chicago show this weekend and was at the second floor where she, you know, created this exhibition within an exhibition. And she's foregrounding all of these different female identified artists throughout the course of time and throughout history. And I just wanted to ask each of you, was there a mentor, a female artist that was really significant in your formation that you'd like to give a shout out for? She was killed before I met her, Anna Mendieta. Yeah, wonderful. I kind of resent that there wasn't more. Every mm -hmm. time 
I go to get an art book out of my library that I, you know, I'm trying to think of something like when I'm painting or, you know, it's always a guy. I'm reaching for those 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Gombrich, yeah. That, you know? yeah. It's like, what would Michelangelo's sister have been like? I mean, it goes back to like, uh, what's her name? Nachlin's essay, Why the No Great Women Artists, you know? I mean, there's phenomenal now over the past 60 years, but still not, you know, it, when they I was- They don't roll off at the tongue as easily because- Yeah, yeah. When, yeah, it wasn't probably part of a lot of the curricular. Uh, curriculum that we were, you know, yeah, and I think, you know like when as I art, young art students, yeah, right? It, like there just wasn't, th there wasn't the females there. There wasn't the female artists. They weren't in the art history book. They weren't, you know, I, it's well, like cry me a river, but I mean, you know, so going forward now, now we look, you know, I'll pull out um, Marlene Dumas or. Uh, I got a bunch over here. Yeah. 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 Well, I would back. I have the issues there. Are you out there, Erica? And she, I, I didn't even go to art school. Oh, I that's just, right. It was weird. And she told me I happened to meet her that I was actually an artist. And so she made me into an artist because she saw me as that. And that's she amazing. made, and she's very lionized now, finally, at a very late age, an experimental filmmaker who made fake virtual stop motion movies. Carlo, look at what I do. <laughs> I just do them except the technology arrived that I could actually make them with computer, right? So Erica, thank you or God damn you. <laughs> it's like, no, turn back the clock. But um, yeah. And then Cheryl, I, I, I want to yeah. give you an opportunity to speak. I just want to check in, Grace, on time, because I know there are probably many questions. Audience questions. questions. Yes. Audience questions. So why don't we end, Cheryl, you you share, oh, and then okay. we can get to some audience questions. Yeah. Um, mine is brief. I was really fortunate that when I was in Rhode Island School of Design, um, at the same time Grace was there in the early 80s, that on the painting department faculty, there were two young women at the time, Suzanne Jolson and Bobby Oliver, Suzanne, who were both active yeah. painters now. But they, mm -hmm. at the time, were in their early 30s, only, you know, 10 years older than the students. But um, it just their presence, but also more than... But anything else was the fact that they were living the kind of life that I wanted, yeah. being an artist. And they modeled it. And I could see that that was a life you could have. And and that was so, uh, that was a North Star for me. Like, just them living. <laughs> and just them being, doing their work, commuting, live, coming back and forth to the city, the way they dressed, just, they, just their presence was so galvanizing to me and and it changed the experience i think so yeah just living and doing it i just want to mention because i just want to answer my own question pat wasserbauer i don't think you're at this talk tonight but unc greensboro is my alma mater for undergraduate and she was so significant to me just because she was doing the work and she was a a, a wonderful professor but also just such an important role model and you know i i think it's great that we have these role models and i just hope the gen z generation has many 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 more um you know i i just wanted to say too for me um you know my my yeah. initial influences living you know in the caribbean coming mm -hmm. first were actually all the like Caribbean thinkers like CLR James. But when I came here to the States and in college, um, somebody that um, actually was very important to me was um, Mernette Larson. Oh, she yeah. was my professor. She, um, she her validation um, was very important to me. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny now because, you know, she's doing so well on her own as an artist again. Um, you know, one of those people that people have rediscovered, but, you know, she, you know, I knew all along, you know, that the way she lived her life as an artist was, was, you know, was the way that I was hoping that I could live mine. I think that is a great place to end and to get into Q&A. And again, I want to thank 
Cheryl, Nicole, Claudia, Maria, Elena, and Grace for conversing with me. And let's dive into some questions. I'm seeing some in the chat. And also, I'm just going to extend my display now so I can see more people here. Um, you know, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question from the audience, and we'll just turn your mic on and, uh, and get more conversation going. I'm just, I'm looking around. Do we have any hands or should I just start with the chat first? Um, in the chat, I think I'm seeing a comment here from Ellen R. My ex-partner was a book dealer and collected many old books and magazines. One was a journal from the early 1900s after the Chicago World's Fair, which detailed dozens of women artists of that time, many who were included in the World's Fair of the last 20 years. Um, it said that these days, so many women are artists. I'm a savvy feminist and art historian, but had never heard of them. They were all erased. Getting back to a topic that uh, uh, rose earlier, Claudia, you were talking about the erasure in new media art, digital arts, but this is something we've seen, I think, again, across the board, across disciplines, this kind of erasure. Thank you for that, Ellen. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very sad. Yeah. Anyone else, you know, if you don't want to raise your hands, if that's Babs too much Ringel to had her hand up. Oh, Babs, I'm sorry. Babs, come on, let's hear your question. Okay, I, I wanted to make a comment. Thanks, and hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. I know a few of you. Um, I wanted to make a comment about this influence of women artists and uh, what that was like for me, just because I arrived in New York in 19... The beginning of 1991 and I came as a painter but one of the things that I noted I at that point wasn't thinking as much about women artists but suddenly I noted that the 90s really brought about this huge uh, change of all these women doing sculpture and installation art and I can just re remember like walking into a, a, a Peter Coyne exhibition or a Nancy Davidson exhibition or an Anne Hamilton exhibition. It was just this incredible change that I was watching take place. And so I, I, I wonder if anyone wants to speak to that, that whole idea of if, if they noticed a time period in their own lives that something like that happened where they it influenced their own work because it really influenced my work and my change and where I went with it. And then one other side note, uh, Nicole, I know Mernet Larson because I currently live in St. Pete, Florida, and she <laughs> taught for 30 years, I think, at, or 35 years at Tampa, at USF Tampa. So, you know, anyway, I just wanted to let you know, and I love her. We we talk anyway. That's it. That's my question, is if anyone else had that kind of same experience. I remember the first time seeing the performance artists from like Carolee Schneeman and them. I think finding more than meat joy at the Strand. I remember that rocked my world. Like I, I had no idea that that stuff even existed. And I mean, Cheryl, I know like we were at RISD at the same time, but I guess I was thinking about artists that were like there, like I loved when Suzanne, and Suzanne, I know you're in the audience, you're awesome. Um, when she would come by, you know, it was like revelation talking to her, you know, but I guess, you know, when I, what I would, was turning to naturally was like the books that were out, you know, readily available. The women weren't readily mm -hmm. available, you know, um, in, in like, you know, the books and the stuff like that, uh, and yeah, it was it was much more of an explosion in the '90s, you know, because of numbers, I think. But yeah, maybe that was a kind of a critical mass point that that, yeah. that '90s period. I, I don't know if anybody else thinks that, but it seemed like that to me. Yeah, and then also the internet coming in and just being able to, you know, if you couldn't get out and around that much, just being able to search everybody, see. Yeah, the accessibility. That right. was such a yeah. huge game changer, you know? Big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does anyone else have any solutions? Anyone you guys in the audience here? You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
Carla, Sid, go ahead and pick someone. I with Sid. Did you have your hand? Sid, and mute. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Hey Grace. Hi Babs. How are hey, you? Sydney. Hey. Um, so I wanted to talk about something that was discussed maybe earlier on about recent MFA graduate students kind of in this commodified newness and the lineage of just entering as like a new person. I don't have my MFA, but I am very young. Um, so I will self-admittedly, I am not a zier, but um, I was born in 94. So I just think it's really important for educators and professors of MFAs to really teach that about longevity and to really teach about like knowing your place in the art world and knowing your conversation and being really specific with your conversation. And also the importance of learning that not everything that you have to say because you're feeling hot right now matters and how you weave into society and being very, very deliberate about that. Um, I know that like, Grace, you know, I was mentored by Dorothea Rockburn. So my mentor is in her 90s. Um, I curated her in a show with somebody that was 18 years old who's never been in a show before in my in her life. So I think having the range needs to be taught. This I, I so appreciate your share. And earlier when we were having these conversations about well, what about a more expanded sisterhood or something that's intergenerational? And it is about conversation, but also the onus is on the professors to teach that and not to be coy about it or, or afraid of, of approaching, um, you know, these topics about, okay, yeah, that's amazing, D Dorothea Rockburn. And then the, the other person you curated in was 18. I mean, fantastic. Uh, it was a 22 yeah. person show. It was a huge range yeah. of yeah. Uh, yeah. artists, but I think it really like professors need to tell students that their work is not original. I think it starts there. Like, I, I don't think like a 25, no offense to any of the 25 year olds, but like, I don't think a 25 year old out there, you have to say your work is in response to this that has happened then. Yeah, I mean, particularly in new media and digital art, um, and that's something that Claudia has spoken to, but across the board, because it's come up, you know, every person on the panel that, you know, again, this erasure or just, you know, this Oedipal kind of complex and, and that it's happens young across. Ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and I mean, I think that's natural. It's the first time you're doing something, you're trying to prove yourself. Um, I, my approach is generally not to just shoot someone down, but to point out lineages. And I think that, you know, teaching history, teaching that, okay, this has been done. How do you recontextualize it, reframe it, make it your own, you know, take something, do something, do something else to it. Jasper Johns, right? Um, and 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 so I, I, I do think that that is critical because quite a few people have discussed that today, that there's this, this hubris and, you know, that like youth can be callous and but but, you know, again, it's your first time. And so education and, and um, communication and, and history telling, you know, is essential. Yeah, it's also important to know that you're in a community. And I think that, yeah. needs, to, that needs to start from at early education and it's to start from this you're an artist for your life and it's not about yeah. the big bang of coming so, out and so Sid this so Sid you you did not have this you the people who were teaching you did not say this they were saying these things to you no Oh, mm. interesting. That's yeah. unfortunate because Nicole, I do not think that was the case at your institution. I see somebody uh, else has her hand. case with me as an educator. As an individual, right, right, <laughs> of course not. not. Not the case. Olga, I see your hand up, so I just wanted to make sure I got to you. And then I think we have some in the chat as well. Olga, are you there? Yes, hi, I'm sorry. Hi. Better don't turn on my video because my computer could shut down, my Zoom on this computer. So oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you see, I immigrated in the from the former Soviet Union in early 90s here, and I could tell you about different type of erasure. <laughs> you see, so it's yeah. part of the I cannot say industry, but it's part of American society, and not only American society. It's any society when people. Uh, try to make place for themselves. Did you go to right now, for example, to Chinatown? Did you see how many new um, galleries there with new people? And it's 
uh, it's uh, um, overproduction is everywhere and among artists as well we have too much of everything including art and you cannot do anything with this and um and uh, I, you, you, so, so I'm not sure how to solve it. And I'm not, again, I could tell you how, for example, uh, I uh, came here and I uh, thought that I would be accepted in, among feminist artists. And then I was told that I'm not enough feminist, for example. For example, and then in some time I was told that not was told, but it was obvious that I should be also queer to uh, be accepted in this in this group of people. So it's different groups, and they have a different type of voice. And and about schools, just <laughs> you see, if you probably uh, watched a video or read something about Damien Hurst, he openly saying, I don't borrow. I steal all my ideas. Well, and Picasso, I mean, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Olga, I mean, I, I think you're making a good point. We have two more questions, so I, I'm yes. so going I'm... to move on. But but the, you're, yeah. you're raising excellent points and finding, you know, the, the, the right kind of um, cohort, I think, is really crucial too. The, the cohort that will support you and, and your positionality and identity. Yeah. Um, thank you, Olga. I, Shelly and then Chloe. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I just have For many years, I hid my age because of the stigma involved. Mm -hmm. And I'm way older than most people here. And now I've decided to advertise it because I've survived all those long years of yeah. working as an artist before I was at RISD long, long before these other folks here. So I just wanted to say that it kind of took a turn because now that I'm so so completely other, I've decided to, um, to state it rather than hide it because I hid it for years because you couldn't get into a show if you were over 30 or over 50 or whatever it was. So good luck everybody. Thank you for sharing that, Shelley. Thank you. Yay. Chloe. Hi. To that point, Hi. I think everyone in this group should just get married. <laughs> Whether you're already committed or not, no. Um, to that point, um, I don't know. I'm just very appreciative of this uh, seminar tonight, just because you can find points of connection irregardless of age and irregardless of like whatever you're your um your your feelings of of um structured connection you know so there's points of connection that are are incredibly strong but don't have such a, an exact definition necessarily that are very much in 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 the mix and that's actually with bringing people together grace thank you so much for such an awesome project but i just yeah. wanted to bring up like one of my uh, mentors that I'm always yelling about when some people come to my studio is Edmonia Lewis. And I wanted to bring that up. When <gasps> oh, right. That was in the notes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or the chat. I yeah. met, and there's this fabulous sculpture in the American wing of Cleopatra Patra when she's in her dying moment. Mm -hmm. And it's the 19th century and it's marble and it's fabulous. And she's an African-American artist who was born in 1844. And she went to Rome and it was accepted in Italy and had a fabulous career and was doing these commissions and was like really a superstar and then got this great commission to do Cleopatra. And um, it was, uh, it's it's there now, but it was forgotten about, to she was forgotten about, it was forgotten about, It the, the sculpture was like put into some warehouse and then some guy who owned a horse named Cleopatra bought it and it just went complete. I mean, talk about forgotten. It's like, you know, I don't know if you know the poem Ozymandias, but it was like dusty in the whole nine yards. And then late, you know, century later, some researcher for the Smithsonian is doing research on, you know, female artists. And it's like, where is that sculpture? And thankfully it still existed and they, and they brought it back and brought it into the mat. Um, but I wanted to make a point about art history, um, how, like the histories that we learn inform our present moment and um and 
I myself studied art history and my references are very much men. And right, I'm right, like, right. What, what do I do about this? So I very much appreciate this talk now in the present. I don't know how you change that institutionally. Um, I was taught a lot of guys from, you know, the 16th, 15th century, you know, and um, that really needs to come forward somehow, maybe with a younger generation. Many, many more books, to Grace's point earlier, need to be written and put into people's faces so that the actual arc of history that's older is informing our, our present. That's, that's just my comment. Yeah, and and also just a, a more kind of inclusive approach of history. You know, the the old adage, history is written by the winners. And I, I think of my art education being, you know, um, primarily Western. And, you know, there are all sorts of problematics that I think need to be addressed through education. Yeah, and for getting and through getting, you know, more people from from diverse positionalities um, and perspectives to be writing these or rewriting these histories, you know, and digging deeper. I just want to say one more quick thing. I just saw Meredith Trombo, she speaks yeah. here. Yeah, about the Gorilla Girls. This oh, right. Is, there was a comment about the Gorilla Girls in the chat above, wondering if there's traction in tracking the percentages of mature women included in influential curator shows, making the inclusion or lack thereof visible through statistics that, um, you know, the Gorilla Girls is great activist group. That's this seems like uh, how uh, Julia Halperin uh, Burns. They do that. The report. Um, is there anything? Did they do anything specifically on older women? I it? saw something at the Judy Chicago show that yeah. was talking about those statistics, and they're still pretty freaking bad. Uh, they're not. It's not what you would think it would be over the course of time at least that was my recollection but i don't have any yeah, specific numbers i mean it's like you they, they had great graphics i mean the gorilla girls man they had all that really great stuff all over the place maybe something like that needs to be more resurrected yeah yeah we have another question regina harsani uh regina do you want to weigh in i'm just trying to make sure we can get to as many people as possible before we right, draw to a close past time so yeah I, I just uh, wanted to tell a quick question. story um, okay, so this will be our last one. If you can share your story. Thank you, Regina. Uh, so also, I'm only 32. So um, and people like Claudia and Carla, you know, constantly remind me that um, the most left out statistic in exhibitions, I'm a museum curator, um, happen to be middle aged women. So I take that into account into all the shows I curate. Um, so that does work the one on one thing. Um, but I will say that um, I had a great influential professor when I was an undergrad and um, a male, and um, I have only like good feelings about him and memories, but I have an intern now who is taking this professor. And so I've been very excited about that and asking how's the class and she let me read the syllabus. And um, because of the pandemic, I think those of us who teach um, know that uh, literacy and writing skills have gone down um, heavily um, yeah. in the last few years. So he changed his course where um, he gave five essays that you could choose from throughout the class and he chose the citations um, that they would have to read. He, he's like not letting them do their own research. They, he's limited the kinds of essays they can write to very specific subjects and given them citations. And every single essay of the five essays was about a male artist of the 21st century or, you know, it was, or I was just shocked to even see that one of them was about Picasso, you know, like in 2024. So I went to the Judy Chicago. That's show. That's demoralizing. <laughs> so, so so I went so I went to the Judy Chicago show, and if you remember, on the second floor, they had those pamphlets that you could take away for free with mm -hmm. pages and pages of just uh, biographies of of women artists, like short um, bios. And so I got a couple of them. I brought it to my intern. And I said, "Please hand this to your professor and tell him that next time he teaches this class, that those essays need to include women artists from this." Oh. All right, that's that a, is oh, that is a wrap. That's a wonderful story to end on. Absolutely. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Wow. Well, thank yeah. you, thank everyone. everyone, for joining us tonight, and uh, thanks to the panelists for a very stimulating, thought-provoking uh, evening. Um, and just a quick note: there won't be a program on March 11th, but please join us on March 18th for a preview of 
uh, M. Annenberg's exhibit called Biophilia in Excelsis, uh, opening uh, March 27th at the Yale Institute for Sacred Studies. Um, and thank you to Vanessa, our, she's part of our Zoom team and all the volunteers at ATOA. Um, hope to see you again. Good night, everyone. Good night, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. This was great. Thanks, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Thank you all did a great job. Bye.